We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best ways for questions come through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, tonight's question comes from Christopher Marinset, host of the Face to Facebook live cast that Mo was on recently. As part of the show, Chris asks, What if you are in my situation? I have a family of six people, including myself, so it's a large group. What if you happen to be quarantined with a large group of people? What would your game recommendations be for a group like mine? Well, thanks for the question, Chris. Uh, now, we've talked about two-player games many times. Uh, two-player co-op, two-player date night, two-player two games. People ask all the time. We've done three-player games and three-player games with a toddler. Uh, plus, speaking of toddlers, we've done all kinds of kids' recommendations. We even did a five-player after-dinner game episode. But you know what? This is the first time anyone has asked about six-player games. Yep. And to be fair, this is generally something we consider more of a party game topic. Yeah. But it sounds like Chris has a party ready made there at home all the time. Very true. So before I get into games that are great with six players, I do want to start suggesting something completely different. Because uh, six players, six is a secret number for me. It's a tipping point. Six is a, a magic number when it comes to a board game group to me. Because once I hit six, that's when I stop trying to look for the game to play with the group. Once I hit six, that's when I personally split the group. I go into two groups of three and play two different three-player games. Now, the reason for this is a combination of overall game time and downtime during the game. Because I find once you get up to six players, most games tend to go very long. Like games on average, and this is a, a huge generalization, but we'll say take about 15 minutes to half an hour per player for your average game. Once you're up to six players, even a quick game, you're looking at an hour and a half to three hours. And that's for a, like an average game, right? Like that's not a heavier game or a long game or an epic game. That's just like your normal one hour game slot becomes a three hour game slot. The other problem is downtime, the time between turns. Unless you're going to play a game with simultaneous play, which we're going to suggest a few later, it can be a very long time before you get to actually take your turn in a six player game. Five other people have to decide what they're doing and then do whatever needs to be done in the board game to do those things. And that can be more downtime than some people are going to want to wait. Yeah, a perfect example of this was my first time with King of Tokyo. We yeah. played with a full table, plus actually an extra monster thrown in. Mm -hmm. By the time the dice got around to me, not only were my choices seriously limited, but I already sort of lost interest. Yeah. Since that game in particular doesn't have much grab until you're involved in the action. Yeah. So and a lot, a lot <laughs> of games are like that. Yeah. Now, I'm not trying to say playing six with six players is bad or terrible or necessarily terrible. It's just over time, having done this and hosted a lot of public play events and hosted events at game stores, that when having large groups, that most groups of people will have more fun playing quicker games in groups of three. But you know what? Sometimes you want everyone to play together, right? If you're doing a family game night, you probably want everyone to play together. Or maybe you don't have a large game selection. So you only have, or like, out of the group, you're the game teacher, or there's only one game teacher, so you can't split into two groups because you don't have someone to teach the games. There are definitely reasons to play with six, and I'm, we're going to assume that Chris wants to play with six. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and again, sort of shifting to that non-six thing, one of the great things about a group as large as six is that you're able to balance people's likes and dislikes more easily. When there are only three people, if one person doesn't like a certain type of game, that becomes very limiting. But with six people, even if two or three people don't like a certain type, that's yeah. still three other people who are who can play that type of game. But then you get into table space problems, but that's for another show. Yeah, true, true. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at some great games that are actually really good with six players. All right, so Chris's question was asked during this period of social distancing and social isolation. I'm going to assume that people have a lot of time on their hands. They're stuck at home with these people. So, as I suggest on our podcast about the best games to play while well, stuck, stuck at home, that's about four episodes ago now, that, man, it, time flies in a way. Like, man, we, we've been doing this whole stuck at home thing for too long. But it's a period like this, right, when you've got more time on your hands than normal that I still think is the great time to bring out those epic, long event games, the ones that I used to say you had to create a Facebook event and plan dinner in the middle of the event. These these are the kind of games I think are perfect 
for six people because a lot of these games are big group games that take a long time. And of course, the biggest, most well-known of these that almost every gamer has heard of has reached legendary status is Twilight Imperium. This epic 4X sci-fi game is now on its fourth printing, which actually boasts a really quick play time of four to eight hours compared to the original, which was known to hit 12 hours regularly. There is no sci-fi game as big or epic as this one. And I gotta say, it is worth taking the time to play. Like even if you play for the full eight hours, it just doesn't feel like it. It's just, it's a rewarding experience and the time actually kind of flies by, even at high player counts, because there's so much to think about, so much to do, that while other players are going, you're planning your own conquest of the stars. Just remember, stay hydrated and <laughs> make sure you don't set it up on your dinner table that you all six have to eat at at some point during that time. <laughs> Very true. So that was Twilight Imperium. All right, for something with a very similar feel, but much shorter playing time than Twilight Imperium, check out Eclipse. Uh, you're basically doing the same thing with a totally different set of mechanics and less minutia, less details. Things are kind of more zoomed out, more of an overview. There's less of a learning curve. There's a lot more exploration because the board's not set. You're flipping stuff over as you go through, but you still get that build up a fleet, explore the galaxy, exploit the systems, and of course the extermination while you're fighting each other. Now, there is a brand new printing of this one out. It's just getting to Kickstarter backers. It's not at retail yet. Um, you can see the copy behind me. It's still in shrink. I have not had a chance to check this out. The original version is fantastic, though. I still think the original is worth picking up. Um, reviews, there's a few initial reviews of the new edition out do sound like it's an improvement on the original. So if you can get either version of Eclipse, it sounds like they're worth picking up. All right, and that was Eclipse. Next, for something a little more down-to-earth, Formula D, or Formula Day, if you happen to pick up the, the German version. This is a racing game that plays 10 people and plays it well, and it works great with six. You play a full game of this, which I don't know many people who do because of the time it takes. You actually play three races. You do one lap solo with no one else playing, and depending on how many turns it takes you to do, that gives you your ranking, your pole position for playing the full game. And then at that point, you play through two full two lap games that is enough to keep a busy a group busy for a weekend in my opinion because you split those plays out so on friday night you do your race for pole position on saturday you do your first race and then on sunday you do your finish race now it is enough you can sit down and play it all at once so i've got to say it's probably going to be a bit much formula d at once to me uh this is a dead simple game using the basic rules uh, Will Wheaton did a show on Tabletop that showed off the basic rules. It's it's all a matter of shifting your car into whatever gear and rolling a die based on what gear you're in. It's pretty much that simple. But then if you are more of a hardcore gamer, gamer you like the minutiae, if you like the details, or you're a gearhead, you can try the advanced rules where you've got rules for image da engine damage and tire wear, and you get the full Formula One experience. Or even more interestingly, in the American version, the Formula D version, if you flip the board over, you can do street racing which the mechanics are the same, but different types of tracks and different miniature teams. Interesting. Lots of, uh, lots of racing fans out there who are missing out on their experiences right now, despite the fact that some, uh, some leagues are trying digital racing. Yep. <laughs> so you can try your own racing for the weekend and use Formula D. All right, this is another one. Uh, earlier in the show, we were talking about feedback. I talked about not usually liking to put on games that are out of print, but I broke the rules here because this is Battlestar Galactica because you're never going to be able to find this for a reasonable price. I don't think it's ever coming back, but this is one of the few social deduction games that I love. And I want to throw this on the list, one, for how much I love this game, and second, because talking to Chris last night, I found out he's a huge role player. He's into role-playing games, and Battlestar Galactica definitely has a role-playing element. Now, I will say, this is actually better at five, but it works with six. Now, this is a game where you are trying to get the Galactica to make it to Cobalt before running out of either food, people, or morale. The thing is, some of the players are actually Cylons and trying to prevent that from happening. All right, and that was Battlestar Galactica. Now, a classic game, Power Grid. From 2004, this is still one of my favorite games of all time. This is one of the games that opened my eyes to the world of German-style games and sparked my love for heavier economic-based board games. 
You're going to expand your network and constantly work to upgrade your power plants while making sure you watch the market and keep enough money to buy the resources you need to power those plants. Now, yes, I know it sounds dry and boring, but I think this is one of the best board gaming experiences that has ever been published. It's engaging if you are... And, and the, I've heard people complain it's math the game. Yes, there's a lot of math. But you know it's money math. It's addition subtraction. All right, and that was Power Grid. All right, next. Six players. It's going to take you a while, but you know what? That's what we're looking at, Epic Games. That's Caverna, the Cave Farmer. This is a brilliant update to Agricola from Uwe Rosenberg, where he's trying to catch people's interest from swapping it to raising cows and planting fields to playing dwarves, raising cows and mining minerals. Uh, it worked for me. Besides what I think is a much cooler and more engaging theme, Caverna actually plays up to seven players, whereas Agricola is out for Chris because it only plays five. There are a number of changes to the base gameplay that I personally think make Caverna more tight and more rewarding, and also more forgiving. It's not just about trying to feed your family and not starving every turn. The only problem here, though, is once you get up to six players and seven's worse, the downtime can be bad. This is a game where I wouldn't be upset if people jump on their forms waiting for their turns, or if they even leave the table, do something else, and be like, hey, Chris, it's your turn. Come on back. Like, you're going you're gonna to take a while playing this, but I do think it's worth it. So we can use it in real-life real turn-based mode rather than real-time yes. play. And I like how you b uh, pronounced it both Agricola and Agricola during that uh, during that mention. I gotta covered, keep it covered. covered we, gotta, we, gotta, we gotta hit all the bases. <laughs> but that recommendation was for Caverna, the cave farmer. <laughs> all right, a last minute addition to the list. This was not in my show notes until I was packing up the games to put behind me for the show. And Deanna pointed out this one plays six players, and I totally missed this one. And this another one I think needs to be on the list for Chris's sake, because again, he's into storytelling and role playing. That's Tales of the Arabian Nights. In this game, you take on the role of a wanderer in the time of Saharazad and Sinbad. You're going to travel around, meet interesting people, go on quests, accumulate treasure. And this is all done through a very well-done choose-your-own-adventure style storybook. Uh, this is one where you're going to be told you see a beggar, and you're going to pick one of six ways to approach that beggar. And then based on the direction you took, if you approached aggressively or if you went up cautiously, you're going to get a different result. This one, I got to say, isn't much of a game to me. Like, you're not playing this game to win. You're not trying to get the most points. You play this game as an experience and end up telling some awesome stories by the end of that experience. And that is Tales of the Arabian Nights. All right, so that's the big epic long game. So let's go to some less epic games. These are games you can finish a little more quickly in your average game night and possibly play two or three games in one night because you can fit these games in. You don't need to, uh, you, you don't have to worry about taking up the kitchen table until dinner. You'll be able to finish in time to clear it off and set the plates. So the first one I've got is Between Two Cities. Now, what I love about this game is the fact that it totally negates the fact that you have to worry about how many people you're playing with because everyone plays simultaneously. You play at the same time. There is pretty much no downtime in this game. Now, in this game, you are drafting tiles to build two cities, one on your left and one on your right. And the thing is, so is the person on your left and your right. And you have a city in common with each of them, which is really neat. So you're working with your neighbors to build cities on each side. But only your weakest city is going to score points at the end of the game. It's a really brilliant system that works really well. And no, I have not tried Between Two Castles and Mad King Ludwig. I hear it's really good. I just don't have a copy. So I don't know if that is an improvement on it, but that is a new fantasy implementation. All right. And that was Between Two Cities. Next, Seven Wonders. Uh, this is the game that gets most recommended at public play events I'm at. If you hit six people, someone in there is going to say, let's play Seven Wonders. If you hit seven people, they're definitely going to say Seven Wonders. Uh, this is a pretty quick-to-teach game. Uh, plays ridiculously fast if everyone knows how to play. It is a lightning quick game if everyone knows what they're doing. The thing is, make sure you don't think of this as a gateway game. Don't be sitting there thinking, oh, I'm home, like Chris, sitting thinking he's got a couple non-gamers in that group of six. You probably don't want to break out Seven Wonders right away. Seven Wonders isn't is simple to gamers because we get the concepts, but certain things like having to buy resources from your neighbors can really trip up new gamers. That is Seven Wonders. 
All right, you've heard me recommend this one before, Flashpoint Fire Rescue, because it is really rare to find a, a cooperative game with such a high player count. There just aren't a lot of six-player cooperative games. Now, all your pandemic games are out. They top at five, and that's only with an expansion. So this is a co-op game that plays with six players right out of the box. And personally, I think it's a better cooperative game in the first place. Just something about fighting fires and saving a kitty from a burning house is just more impactful than removing virus cubes from a board. Plus, who wants to think about pandemics right now? Absolutely. That was Flashpoint Fire Rescue. All right. What Sean mentioned at the top of the show here when talking about games with too much downtime is King of Tokyo. This is Kaiju Yahtzee. Big monsters battling in a King of the Hill dice game. Um, six is the max player count. Trust me, don't play at seven, as we mentioned earlier. Don't try to add the extra monsters you might own. Stop at six, really, if you really do. Um, you're going to want to play this one also with the expansion, in my opinion. You want to pick up the power-up expansion. That makes the game asymmetrical. I personally won't play the game without it. But this is a great one if you've got kids or non-gamers, because everyone kind of gets Yahtzee. They're going to roll the dice three times. They're going to pick which set to keep and then do something because of it. Uh, really, a really good, light, quick game that I like. This is one I personally like to use to open the night up to get everyone talking and get everyone socializing. Yeah, don't let my bad experiences with it sour you on it. We made yeah. a mistake. That was King of Tokyo. All right, next I have what happens when hardcore gamers get a hold of Battleship, and that is Captain Sonar. This is a turn-based or simultaneous game where six players are going to split your team into two three-person teams, and each player is going to take on a different role in a submarine. The goal is to locate and sink the other team's sub before they do the same with you. Now, you start off turn-based, so everyone learns their position, like so the, the weapons officer and the engineer and the, and the navigator all know what they're doing, but then as soon as everyone's got their roles down, turn it off, start playing real-time, and you have a raucous good time. This game gets... Uh, it just it's it's a loud almost party atmosphere while playing a fairly serious game. And that was Captain Sonar. All right, here's one I need to break out again. One I tend to forget about. That's Colt Express. This is a very cool programmed movement game. So think like Robo Rally, but it's set in the old west, and you are playing a train robber. You have to program your moves to move around the train, avoid the warden and grab or steal loot from the other players. Different event cards make it hard to predict what other players are doing, because, for example, when the train goes under a tunnel, you're going to play your cards face down, and then no one knows where you're moving after that. As an added bonus, the game just looks sweet, because it's a full 3D cardboard train that you move your meeples on. And I got to say, it's frivolous, but it actually comes with some like 3D cactus and scenery that just, I don't know, I, I like it. it. You put it next to the train, and it just looks cool. And that was Colt Express. All right. I swear we can't do a game recommendation episode without me mentioning Pitch Car. Uh, now, I prefer this one with eight players. It's fun with any player count. I've even had fun with two. Six people, Pitch Car works great. There's just enough cars to get in the way of each other without it being crowded. This is still probably my favorite dexterity game of all time. Um, it's accessible to almost everyone. You can play it with kids. Uh, everyone I've showed it to just gets it and likes it and enjoys it. What's kind of cool is about this is if you want to convince people to play games and they're like, oh, I don't like board games, right? So if you're stuck with five other people and there's someone there that's like, oh, I don't like board games. Well, this is almost more of an activity or a sport. Like you're flicking it. Like this is shuffleboard more than Monopoly, right? So it's, it's a little easier to sell on non-gamers. Now, one thing about Pitch Car is it does take up space and the kind of space you use matters, too. Uh, if you've got some older folks, you might not want to, want to be doing it on the floor so the people weren't standing up and getting down yeah. too much. Uh, but if you don't have a big enough table, you're a little more limited on what kind of a track you can set up. So while space is an issue, Pitch Car just is a great game. I, I, is there anyone who has ever not liked Pitch Car when you set it up? I mean... No. <laughs> no. There are people who've liked it more than others, but... I've never had anyone like, oh, that was terrible. I yeah. hate it. I'll never play again. Yep. Uh, like, even, Deanna's, even, not a big, Deanna's not a big dexterity game player, but even, I can get her to play. Even when you gave Between the Table jumps, I still kept playing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that was terrible. That was a bad idea. Now, the base set of pitch card, you can fit on a 3x3 three three table. It's not the most interesting race, but it definitely works. 
definitely better with more expansions and sets and big setups. So and that was Pitch Car, and they keep putting out expansions. So. Yes, I got to get that's 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 my goal. Is we're not going to Origins this year. Is I was able to get a I wasn't expecting it, but I was able to get a review copy of Vinho. So I'm like, if you were able to give me Vinho, you'll give me the loop to loop for Pitch Car next year. That's my goal. Right. Is uh, uh, that's a life goal for next year or a business goal, I guess, at this point. All right, I mentioned. Um, oh, I almost jumped ahead. Sorry. Uh, this is another one that I think again it's going to be good for Chris because he's into role playing. That Shadows over Camelot. This is another rare social deduction game that I actually enjoy. And the thing I found is that I like social deduction games where you play a role, where you play a character, where it's not just lie to your friends. And that is what Shadows over Camelot is. This is a semi cooperative role playing game, basically. Everyone takes on the role of a knight of the round table, and you're going to work to defend Camelot and complete various quests. The interesting bit is one of the knights might, and no might, be a traitor who's working for the forces of darkness. One of the cool things about this game that I've always liked and which makes it great for public play events is that people can jump in and out of the game once it's started. So that's always nice. So if you've got someone who has to, you know, who either gets sick of playing or someone wants to join in part way, you can do that in this game. And that was Shadows Over Camelot. All right, next I mentioned program movement earlier with uh, Colt Express, we get to the oldest and best program movement game, uh, Robo Rally. Although I, I can't actually confirm it was the first, but it's definitely the one people know the most, the most popular. Uh, think logo, turbo graphics, right? You program your robot to move through a maze of obstacles and be the first person to hit all the objective cards in play, which would be dead simple, except your program cards are random, randomized, and while well, all the other players have a bunch of armed push robots out there trying to do the exact same thing. Uh, my only caveat here is that I do prefer the older editions of the game. Well, the new version works. It just doesn't have the complexity and depth of tactics and strategy of the older version, but it does mean the new one is more accessible to new gamers. Absolutely, and that was Robo Rally. And we've even talked about that on how to play that with social distancing. Yes, we have. <laughs> Uh, next, uh, classic Catan. Catan and all of its various subversions and isotopes tend to have five to six player expansions. Uh, again, I almost forgot about this one until I saw it on someone else's list. Like I said, I do do some research when making these lists to make sure I don't overlook something. And Catan was one I probably would have. Because when we first started getting into tabletop gaming after the dark times between university and when we started gaming again, we were playing Catan every Saturday night at my parents' house. And often those nights had six players. And I actually learned to prefer Catan at five to six players. And what that is, the, the big thing that does that is with that many players in between turns, so after everyone finishes their trading, you get a chance to build. So that gives you some reason to pay attention and gives you something to do when it's not necessarily your turn, which I, helps you focus on the game. Plus, it also made it so that the robber wasn't as bad because when you got six people playing, there's a lot of chances of that robber coming up between your turns. Yeah, and that, well, yeah. Now, this is for Catan, but really any of them. Like, there's a five to six player for Seafarers. There's a five to six player for City as Knights. Um, there's newer ones, Traders and Barbarians. I haven't tried that one, but this is for any of the versions of Catan with the five to six player expansion. And that was Catan with five, six player expansion. All right, another one. I didn't notice until I was putting get, grabbing boxes from downstairs, and that is Libertalia. Now, this one I've had mixed results, but it's usually based on whether I'm playing with new players or experienced ones. This game definitely has a learning curve. With a group who all know the game and know the cards and know what to expect, I've had a great time. And the more people playing, the more interactions that happen, the more things are going to happen in the night phase and everything. But I got to say, the first few games of Libertalia are always a little rough. But I did put this on the list because I know Sean's been playing it, and he knows this one. Well, I don't know about a fan, but it was an amusing play on Board Game Arena amongst the group of uh of friends who, who who all play together. Uh, there's a lot to take in on that game, though. It's horrible to uh, learn online. Yeah. I, again, oh, in person, too. Oh, okay, because I had no idea what I was doing for the first probably two full games mm -hmm. of playing that game. It just, uh, the presentation, and uh, yeah, you know it's a card game, but trying to figure out what's going on with day and yeah. night and cards disappearing and reappearing in people's hands, it gets a little confusing. But, you know, when there is some uh, some great stuff to happen when you're at the table. Uh, yeah. And there's that, that, that sort of, you know, there's the bluffing and things that are going on. 
So it's a great, uh, a great thing when you're right there, as long as you don't, uh, you know, anger anyone during the game. And you got to look. Oh yeah, there. it's definitely a backstabbing game. That is not a, yeah. That is a game where you may, if your friends don't like in your face backstabbing, you probably don't want to play Libertad. But yeah, that, that's the thing is, if everyone knows the cards and everyone knows the distribution and how the cards work, it plays great. But if you don't, yeah. But maybe being stuck in quarantine, now is the time to learn those cards. With a group that knows it, it can play really well. Well, that was Libertalia. And now for some lighter games. Once you hit six players, you're quickly entering party game land. Mm -hmm. So here are some quick-to-play, good, larger group games that work great with a party of six. Yeah, starting with one of my favorites, uh, Codename. Break into two teams of two, one code giver, two guessers, and you're going to be playing Codenames for hours. Uh, personally, I think six is the bare minimum for code names. Um, they, that's about how many you need. And now, this is one of those rare games that I admit I did not like at first, but grew on me. So even if you usually prefer heavier games or economic games and don't like party games, give code names a chance. It worked for me. So that was code names. Next, Telestrations. This is a hilarious party game based on the parlor game Eat Poop You Cat. Yes, that is the name of a game. You start off getting a random clue, you then have to draw that clue, then pass your book, and then you're going to get a clue. You're going to look at what that clue says, and you're going to try it, draw it, and then you're going to pass it over, and then you're going to get a picture, try to write what that picture is, and keep going around until you get your book back. There's probably very little chance that that word at the front matches that picture at the back. Yes, there's a scoring system, but you know what? I, most people just play it as an activity and play until they're sick of it. Yeah, I know. Telestrations is great fun. We played it at a couple of uh, the parties down at your place. And it's just hilarious, especially yeah. with a range of artists. Because yes. you, can't, you can't do fantastic art with little right-on wipe-off markers, but seeing the different levels of art coming from people is mm -hmm. really amusing. So that was Telestrations. All right, one that I just find odd that seems to keep coming up on the show recently. Uh, Skull. I can't remember what, but I know we talked about Skull not that long ago. This is a, a neat auction push-your-luck game played using coasters. Uh, you create a stack of coasters composing of one skull and a number of flowers. You decide where the skull is. Players then take turns betting on how many coasters they can flip. I can flip four without being a skull. And Sean's like, I can flip six. And someone's like, I can flip seven. And like, fine, you can flip seven, do it. And then they try. Go, you flip, you flip, you flip, and try not to flip a skull. If they do it, they win the round, and you keep playing. But if they're wrong, they're going to lose one of their coasters. You can be completely eliminated of the game. But the first player to get two right wins the game. It's dead simple. I basically just taught you how to play it without showing you the physical pieces. It is way more fun than I would have thought it should be. And the, the version that's available now, called just called Skull, there's an older printing called Skull and Roses. The artwork on this card has a very uh, Deus de la Muertos look to it that I really dig. It's just a really cool looking game. But you can technically, if you've got a bunch of beer coasters, you can play it at home. Absolutely. I believe uh, our, our uh, mix of gamers and non-gamers episode oh, was one okay. of the last times we've talked about We talked about that one. And that That's was fair. Skull. Next is Cash and Guns. In this game, you are playing a group of gangsters who just finished off the heist of a lifetime. And you're in the process of splitting the loot. And of course, it doesn't go good. You have basically Mexican standoff a game that involves pointing foam guns at your friends. So this may not be for everyone, but if you're cool with the theme, this can be a lot of fun. No, these are not realistic looking weapons, and, but you may not want it in your home if you don't want a game where you're pointing guns at your mother-in-law. Uh, plays better the more people you have. So this is a great six-player game if you're into the theme. And that was Cash and Guns. Uh, Liar's Dice. This is another classic, kind of like Skull, where... It's great because most people have everything they need to play in their collection already, especially if you're a gamer. You just need five D6 and a cup per player. Uh, this is a push-your-luck game where you're going to rattle your dice, you're going to look, and then you're trying to get a better roll than the person on your left. The thing is, you have to beat the person on your left, so you either have better roll better than them or be pretty good at lying at what you have. And, of course, when you pass your cup to the next person, when you don't pass it, you go to the next person, they can call your bluff if they think you didn't actually roll better than the other person. Every time you lose, you lose a die. Once all your dice are gone, you're out of the game. Uh, very popular parlor game, party game. There are a ton of variants out there. It, there's a Wikipedia page with a list of variants for Liar's Dice. This is, a, this is a popular big group game, always has been, probably always will be. And that was Liar's Dice. 
Uh, concept. Anytime we talk about groups playing games and party games, I have to mention concept. This is my favorite party game. This is my favorite clue guessing game where you get a word and you're trying to get everyone else to guess it. Uh, once you've got six people, you got two choices. You can split into teams or do what we do where one person gives out the clues and whoever gets it right, then is the next person giving out the clues and you play until someone's sick of playing. Just literally don't use the scoring that's it's the one game that even like I, i've used the scoring in illustrations i refuse to use the scoring in concept all right well that was concept all right next vlada shavato is a, a very well-known game designer for producing heavy games that for some reason decided to improve on pictionary or win lose or draw with a game called pictomania uh this is a neat game where there are seven clues for each round and all six people are trying to draw one of those seven things, but you don't know who's drawing what. So there's always one thing that no one's drawing. What's really cool about this game is it's simultaneous play. Everyone's drawing at once and trying to guess at once. It's really neat. And six players is the perfect count for this because of the fact there's seven things. What I like about this is, yes, drawing kind of matters, but no, what's even more important? The deduction. To be able to look, go, well, I'm drawing an apple. Sean's obviously drawing a car. I know those aren't the clue. And I'm looking over at D and she's drawing something round. I bet you that's the sun. Like the fact, the thought process used in this game is really neat. And it's that deduction and reasoning combined with the silly drawing game that I really like about Pictomania. And that was Pictomania. All right, Camel Up. This is a very silly racing game uh, and betting game that features one key mechanic that makes the game. And that is the fact that camels stack on top of each other. That's why it's called Camel Up. And then if a camel moves and it has camels above it, they move with it. So it's a really neat racing game using that basic mechanic. Uh, it's got a neat little dice tower that looks like a pyramid the dice come out of. Uh, it's very cool. One of the neat things here is, unlike many racing games, you're not playing a specific camel or a specific racer. Just at any point during the game, you can bet on where the individual racers are going to finish. So you can bet on the losing camel or the winning camels. Uh, this one has been a huge hit with local gamers of all ages. I know people who bought this for their kids, and it works great with people of different experience levels. Something about the, the basic theme, even non-gamers grasp it right away. And that is Camel Up. Next is For Sale. At one time, every game night I attended, literally every WGR game night when I did the Windsor Gaming Resource I attended, started off with a game or two or three of For Sale. This was the game we played until seven people showed up because it played a max of six players. So we're like, oh, there's three of us. Let's play some for, some, some for sale. Oh, another person showed up. Let's play another round. Oh, we're up to five people. Let's play another round. We're at six people. It's another round. Oh, we're up to seven. Time to split up and start playing something else. Uh, this game is a card-driven game where you play through two rounds. One, you're getting money. Then the second round, you're using the same cards to buy properties. It's a classic game. Uh, probably every podcast that talks about classic games has mentioned this one. This is a fantastic game. It's, it's really quick to teach and plays under half an hour, even at the full player count. And that was For Sale. It's a long list today. I didn't realize how long it was while writing it out. Uh, next, we have Bean or Bonanza. Uh, six is, to me, uh, the one of the best player counts for Bonanza. Best count to do bean planting. We mentioned this one many times in the show, and for good reason. This is one of my favorite games to play with groups of five or more. Uh, the unique mechanic, of course, is that you can't sort your hand. And you're forced to play the first card in your hand every turn. So it's all about making the right trade before the turn order gets back to you so your hand's in shape for planting what you want to plant. Bean or <laughs> Bonanza. Bonanza. We need to make a North American version. It says bean <laughs> in great big letters. It's what everyone I know calls it. I Here's an older one from the designer of Magic the Gathering, Richard Garfield, the great Del Moody. This is a ladder-based card game. And it's the one hobby board game that I was literally able to get my relatives to play, like aunts and uncles, even my grandmother at one time. Uh, this is one of those games where you're trying to play a better hand of cards than the person before you in order to get rid of all the cards in your hand. So you're dropping a set number of identical cards. So if someone else drops three nines, you could drop three eights or, say, three fives, and while three threes would be the, the best thing that could take that particular trick. The goal is to be the first place and to play your entire hand, when played over multiple rounds, that's when this game really shines, is you are assigned roles based on how quickly you are out of cards. Roles from the Great Dal Moody all the way down to the Greater Peon. Now, we like to combine those roles with silly hats and costuming, and we even have like a big medallion for the Dal Moody to wear. Plus, there are actual rules in the game that you can play with where everyone gets to boss around the peon, 
And when we play, that's the person who has to go get everyone's drink. And that was the great Dal Moody. All right, San Francisco cable car or just cable car, or I think the other version is New York. There's a few different printings of this game. Uh, this is an excellent tile playing game that maxes out at six. And for me, the more players you play with, the more cutthroat it becomes. And to me, the more fun. There's the base game where you're trying to get your cars to have the longest routes, getting bonus points for getting to the center. Or if you're more uh, into economic games and gaming, you can swap it up. So instead you're buying stock from the various colors. And then you none of it, you don't own any. And that makes the game much more deep and uh, strategic. So both methods of play are just as valid. Both are fun. One better for non-gamers, one better for hardcore gamers. And that was San Francisco Cable Car. And my last recommendation of the night, and that is New York Slice. Uh, this surprisingly thematic game, the lead player builds a piece of all the tiles and then has to divide it up into a number of portions based on the number of players. Then each player is going to choose their own portion. The interesting bit is the person who split it up gets to pick last, so they better be careful with how they split that pizza. Now, the slices come in different types and are worth points based on how many of each slice there are in the game. At the end of the game, only players who have the most of each type are going to score points for those slices. There's also some rules about eating slices and getting points for pepperoni bronies, losing points for sardines, and then there's a thing with the special order of the day that gets tossed on one of the portions, which the person who gets that portion can break the rule in a certain way. But this is actually a really simple game, really easy to teach, great party game, uh, and like game with some strategy involved. Like there, there's definitely more of a game here than you first think when you first play it. I also often play this multiple rounds in a row because of how quick it is. There is one big problem, though, is when you finish, you're going to want pizza. And if you don't have readily accessible pizza, that can be a little frustrating. Well, I got to say, I'm upset. I don't think sardines should be a negative. Nothing yeah. <laughs> wrong with seafood on pizza. One of the variant rules is actually to swap it so that the, the pepperonis are the negative points and the sardines are worth points. But yes, in the basic rules, sardines are worth minus three points. And that was New York Slice. Now, for some honorable mentions, these are either games that we're not big fans of or that Mo hasn't played, but that yep. many other people strongly recommend at six players. We're not going to go into detail about these, but just run through the list quite quickly. All right, so the top one here is Game of Thrones, the board game, second edition. I played the first edition. It was fun. I've heard second edition is better. I'm not a huge Game of Thrones fan. Uh, next is Cosmic Encounter. Everyone seems to love this game. Everyone but me. Uh, Dune. Still haven't gotten to try this one, but I hear that to really see the game, you have to play with the max, which is six players. You need all the players to get the full experience. Uh, the classic game Civilization from Avalon Hill. Uh, I have a friend who swears it's the best game ever made by man. I don't know. Uh, Betrayal of House on the Hill. This is another one everyone seems to love but me. Personally, I find it far too random. It can be great, but it can be terrible, and I'm not usually willing to take that chance of playing a terrible game. Uh, then the Zombicide game. There's a ton of these out there now with different themes, sci-fi, fantasy, or um, modern horror. I, I thought it was well done, but it just, I don't know, it didn't grip me. I, I had the fantasy one, and I sold my copy after five plays, but I know people who love them. Uh, of course, Werewolf and all the various editions and versions of White Knight Ultimate being better, because for the full Werewolf, you really need more than six people. But all the one night versions, one night vampire, one night werewolf, one night, I don't even know, superhero, supervillain, I think there is. Uh, everyone knows how I feel about most of those social deduction games, but they're definitely popular. Uh, Jamaica, a pirate themed racing game, did not do it for me, but I see it recommended all the time at six players. So people out there must love it. I admit I didn't try it at six, I only tried it at three. And then my final recommendation I've seen by many people is Arkham Horror. Now, I only played this with five players. And I found it to be a painful five plus hours of other people telling me where to move my meeple and reading cards to me. But you know what? Everyone else seemed to enjoy it. I Maybe I just played with the wrong group. All right. Well, we're going to hop into the lobby here. So we've had a lot of chat going on uh, throughout this. It's uh, good. And not just pizza rolls. So... <laughs> uh, Red, Red Meeple Ryan was right up close. He uh, he jumped in as we were reviewing Red Formula D, 
but did mention both Jamaica and Camel Up, which we got to eventually. There you go. We got to those. Yep. Uh, Poncho72 was, men- was men- uh, mentioning that he saw a big board gamer, and they had a Hex Encounter war game with huge maps and 1,800 plus counters. Perfect for six players. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they're out there. All right, what I'm trying to do is get the ones from the chat people recommended so we can toss them in the show notes. Do we have any six players we missed? Uh, so uh, let's see. What have we got here? Um, good. Uh, trying to see which uh, which ones are clearly. I, say, uh, I did see Illuminati. Six player Sagrada. Sagrada plays six? I didn't think it went up that high. Fair enough. Uh, apparently the new version of Camel Up has cameras to go backwards. I've heard that. See, the problem is I wasn't willing to buy a game I already bought. I hate when they upgrade. Like, they put a plastic dice thing in there, but I bought Camel Up and the expansion. Now I feel like my version's useless. That bugs me. <laughs> uh, Illuminati. Uh, TI4, we've six. got. Illuminati does six. Yeah, I got that. Unlimited Naughty. Yeah. I wish I knew what the Hex Encounter War game was with huge maps. I think you may have been joking, but that's okay. All right. Uh, I had played a 12-player Battletech game. That didn't finish, and we played for 12 hours. I see people liking some of our re- recommendations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Empires, Age of Discovery. Uh, Gill is pointing out that she's not a fan of Jamaica unless everyone is new to it. Okay. Everyone is new. <laughs> so if there aren't people who know the game already. Oh. Ryan's got a few more here. Jet Set. Sorry, you just... the card game. Inca Gold. Yeah, you and just... Steampunk Rally. You uh you froze up on us in our trunk right now, but oh jeez, we'll, we'll well, again you... at least it hit the lobby. You're in the lobby, exactly. We've been going good all night. Uh, Tiny Towns does that play six? Tiny Towns should be nope. good at six. Two to four. Oh, it's two to four. Okay, I'm like it. it you know what? You just need more resources. Or no, sorry, if you just no, have sorry. more Tiny resources. Towns, you... part, Tiny Towns plays six, but is highly not recommended at six. Because Lords of oh, Vegas, okay. Lords of Vegas is only two to four. Ah, uh, okay. Flashpoint is fun but frustrating. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, oh, so King of New five... York. See, King of New York. I personally prefer Tokyo. New York just felt fiddly. And, and Sagrada has the five to six expansion. That's oh, there's that's the, okay. See, I don't have the expansion. No, I'm willing to put it down. I'll toss it down. I know we had a little it's longer. Not like than you don't trust list. Sagrada as a good game. <laughs> oh, Deanna loves it. I've yeah. heard it's better. I with the expansion. I don't mind it. I just find there's other games that do similar better. I've got a lot of fans of it uh, on my feed. so Yeah, yeah like I uh, said, it's it's definitely popular. I just didn't think of it as a six-player game at all. All right, covered. so we got Illuminati, Martian Dice, Grotto with the Expansion, Empire's Age of Discovery, Jet Set, Ink and Gold, and Steampunk Rally from our chat room. Flux is not... I will never recommend Flux. And apparently Danielle and I, the next time we get together for a con, are going out for anchovies on pizza. Oh, there you go. Deanna will do anchovies. She'd right. happily do anchovies. All right. I'm the one that doesn't like it. Yeah, no, no. So I, I do not. We definitely did mention Catan. Yeah, uh, yeah Flux, I, re- I refuse to recommend Flux because the game might not end. <laughs> I think Munch can play six technically too for a similar style of take that game that may not end. Uh, Flux I mean, is fun if it ends. Well, and that's one Munchkin. of the things. And, and with Flux, it also helps, like, if you've got a group of six players, you've got to try and find the Flux theme that everyone yeah, that enjoys, fits. right? Like, if, yeah. if you've only got two Doctor Who fans, Flux Doctor Who or whatever, you know, might not work. Or if you've only got one Monty Python uh, fan, Flux Monty Python is probably not going to be the best yeah. choice. But especially the theme ones to make you do silly things that are tied to the theme. Like, like there's a reason, like, like Monty Python Flux, you have to do Monty Python qu- quotes, or you have to talk with an outrageous accent, or you have to walk silly, or you have to bang your hands together like coconuts. Like, there, there's a reason they're themed. They actually are themed. And that's part of why I would not want, uh, yep. I would not want to play any of those. So I said, definitely not. I am not a Flux fan. Yep. I've tried multiple versions. It's it's okay. I Flux is one game where twice I played and did not get a turn. And from that point on, I have not liked Flux. Now, from what I understand, we were playing with more people than it's supposed to, so that could have been why. So I did give it another shot, and I was like, I can see the appeal of this. More so for non-gamers, right? You know, if here's six of you, and you just got your beer delivery from the local chapter craft beer place that's open during the pandemic, and they drop that off, and you're going to start just, you know, you're just there to have a good time, and the game's something that's happening, 
while you're having a good time, sure, Flux is great for that. So I'd rather play Skull, for example, but... Like the Star Trek Flux, I thought was kind of interesting. And I'm not a huge fan of the Creeper rules that they introduced, where you can't win if this card's in front of you, because it just makes the game even longer. 